So thank you, Sarah, very much for the invitation to join all of you this morning, as well as to Susan Cassidy and all of the folks at Harvard for putting together this fine event. I'm delighted to be here in this role of this new position of Director of Collections Initiatives for Ivy Plus Libraries. Before looking forward at what steps are underway to explore collective collections work that's happening at Ivy Plus Libraries, let's take a brief moment and look back. What is Ivy Plus Libraries? Collect and specifically, what is the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group, and how did we get here? From the quite successful Borrow Direct Resource Sharing Initiative and service, questions emerge, like what does our scholars' use of Borrow Direct tell us about our general collections as an ecosystem of information? How does scholars' use of Borrow Direct inform and evolve management of our collections? Striving to explore and answer these questions, in fall of 2014, the AULs of collections at Borrow Direct participating institutions sent a proposal to their university librarians that, based on the success of Borrow Direct, as well as the collaborative work that these AULs had been doing since 2008, they sought support to expand on collaborative collective collections. The result was that the university librarians asked the AULs of, to draft a business plan for what are their initiatives and their vision. The university librarians also put forth a new name for the group, the Ivy Plus Collection Development Group, with representatives from each of the 13 cooperating Ivy Plus libraries. Borrow Direct remains the resource sharing network service that is the Ivy Plus library's first cooperative initiative. One could say Ivy Plus libraries the Cooperative of Libraries brought to you in part by Borrow Direct. This is an excerpt from the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group vision statement. The Ivy Plus Libraries embrace a vision for collection development and management which recognizes our preeminent academic research and special collections as one great collection in support of teaching, research, and public missions of our respective institutions and the global scholarly community. The Ivy Plus Libraries will endeavor to implement projects and initiatives which in time will move research materials in a variety of formats above the institutions to embed them in a networked infrastructure that fosters collaboration, cooperation, and consolidation in support of building and providing access to distinctive academic research collections. In addition to the collections group cooperative endeavors, there are other examples of cooperative collections work that began with selectors coming together to address, pro to address problems collaborati collaboratively, such as music with the distributed acquisition of contemporary composer scores by participating institutions, and in Latin American studies, with the purchase of Brazilian monographs being distributed by geographic region by participating Ivory Plus libraries. So when it comes to these existing collections, how do we review, assess, evaluate them, and what do we consider a success? How do we assess and evolve cooperative arrangements that reflect the vibrant unpredictability of research and how do we then also make sure that the full life cycle of collection management is met? These are just two of the many questions the collections group of colleagues throughout the Ivy Plus libraries are asking. And since I began as the inaugural uh, director of collections initiatives in June, one of the initiatives that colleagues and I are working on, have been working, we've been working to develop a project plan for collective collections analysis to help us just begin to answer and delve into these questions. We're at the beginning, we are at the trailhead. The goal of our work is to write an Ivy Plus Libraries collection statement that builds upon the Ivy Plus Library Collection Group's vision and to develop a model for collections analysis that supports collective collection initiatives focused on both prospective collection development of resources in all formats as well as shared print retention. Presently, we are beginning phase one of the project, which includes a lot of behind the scenes work on collective collection analysis. 
Again, we're working to establish an Ivy Plus Libraries collection statement, conduct an environmental scan so as to systematically gather information about collection governance and management, existing collaborations, of which there are many, and about each institution in a comparable way. We're going to conduct a data inventory and data profiles for what is available, including circulation stats as, as well as that other data that can tell us about how our collections are used. We're going to craft a recommendations for, de for collection and data analysis, excuse me, collection of the data and then the analysis. And we are going to be defining two pilot projects for phase two, whereby the, the model that we are developing for collection analysis will be tested and refined. The goal is that by writing this collection statement for the cooperative building and testing of collections analysis model, Ivy Plus Libraries will then have a blueprint for investigating that will be a foundation for and help in enable data informed collective collections in all types, in all formats. But beyond the data of, or excuse me, beyond the task of creating an analysis model, what are the key challenges that the Ivy Plus libraries face when it comes to collective collections? It's a foggy landscape. There are many questions to be sure and many challenges. Here are a couple. The concept of comprehensive collections, the change from branded local ownership compared to collective stewardship and access. To the first, I think it's really important to remember that while all of the Ivy Plus libraries have very rich, deep, and broad co um, collections, libraries have never had comprehensive collections or collections that have been equally accessible throughout the Ivy Plus libraries. That is why it is necessary to have resource sharing like Interlibrary Loan and Borrow Direct, services that thrive, have name recognition, and that our scholars rely upon. So let us rephrase and replace striving for comprehensive collections and broad just-in-case collection development with addressing complex and ever-changing conditions through collections as a service and work on very careful alignment amongst the Ivy Plus libraries to create collective collections in a complicated, organic, evolving scholarly ecosystem. As Dan Hazen wrote, the library can solidify its own sense of purpose and also point the campus toward the future by recasting its documentation in terms of all the research resources associated with its users and the fields they represent. Insisting on inflexible, site-specific codifications of our hard copy acquisitions will only mire us in the past. Looking at the present and into the future so as not to become mired in that past, Ivy Plus Libraries is different than a 13-institution comprehensive collective collection. Looking again at the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group vision, Quote, the Ivy Plus libraries will endeavor to implement projects and initiatives which in time will move research materials in a variety of formats above the institution that fosters collaboration, cooperation, and consolidation in support of building and providing access to distinctive academic research collections. The vision calls for initiatives that focus on maximizing access while also reducing purchasing, processing, sharing, and storage costs, and where making evidence-based decisions should be the norm and not the exception. Pragmatism should be a touchstone where the likelihood of use and sustainability are very valid concerns. Such a vision of collaboration that maximizes access, reduces purchasing, processing, and storage costs is necessary because of the evidence that points to the necessity to do so, including the decrease in funds available for collections of materials. This graph shows the, the tremendous acquisition strengths of the Ivy Plus libraries. If dollars, as Daniel noted, are a vehicle, then the Ivy Plus libraries have one mighty convoy. But how can we collaborate and work together to, together to make this convoy go deeper and broader? But we also see that fu the funds available are not increasing as in the past. 
The demand for content in multiple formats, as well as the needs for fun to support the infrastructure for accessing and hou housing collections of all types, like discovery services, link resolvers, institutional repositories, digitizing, et cetera, means that materials budgets are spent differently and that the funds do not all go to just the content. Additionally, circulation among 12 of the 13 Ivy Plus libraries has decreased steadily over the past five years with projections that the decrease will continue. Yet despite decreasing circulation of tangible items, the number of monographs purchase, purchased is still steadily increasing, though at a slower rate. Furthermore, projections from publishing industries around the world show increases and in growth, except for in South Korea. I don't know why. <laughs> So the number of content and the number of publications is increasing around the world, also in the United States. The number of titles with ISBNs printed in the United States, again, is increasing. I'm not sure why there was a tremendous spike in 2010, but if we just look at the dotted line and future projections, we see that, again, the number of publications available keeps increasing. So there's an increase in material available to purchase that may be of interest to our research communities, and yet we have less funds to buy content, less availability of space to keep physical collections, and the circulation of those physical monographs that have been purchased is decreased. Also, as Tom noted earlier this morning, there's also a huge influx and greater volume of materials that document our human experience. Additionally, when it comes to the human intellect and skill needed to manage collections, there is a much broader need for a variety of core skills to match where scholars are going, where collections are going. We have digital scholarship, data management, as well as ensuring that areas such as e-resource management, collection and discovery to ensure access, metadata creation, and so on, we need to make sure that those are robustly staffed so that all the collections we have and continue to acquire can then be accessed and discovered. This is a very broad, big picture um, of some data that supports collaborative collections of the, around Ivy Plus libraries. And it shows that the significant collections acquisitions power can be used to bring to life the vision of collaborations that, has, that reduce purchasing, especially unnecessary duplication, processing, and storage costs, while maximizing access, especially to very unique needed content. And while we have all of this data pointing to the necessity for significant change, it's also important to pause and realize that when it comes to evidence-based and data-informed decisions, that as we see data and evidence, our very human nature is to question or refute any data that goes against our pre-existing philosophical structures and personal stories. That is, you know, our current concepts is where we are comfortable. Dan Cahan, law and psychology professor at Yale Law School and the founder of the Cultural Cognition Project notes that when it comes to accepting scientific data and facts about global warming, the disposal of nuclear waste, the effect of conceal and carry laws, humans tend to accept and assimilate new facts only if it fits into their pre-existing narrative of meaning. So when it comes to our collections, if data about our collections is counter to our current narratives, then it's time to craft new narratives. Dan Cahan states, evidence can't be refuted by just saying no. Eula Biss, professor of English at Northwestern University and the author of On Immunity, talks about vaccinations and how for those against vaccinations, facts alone may not change our perceptions. The incorporation of personal narratives analysis of facts, and the philosophy behind the facts may create a framework of understanding and help create new philosoph philosophical structures. So as we craft new philosophies of library collections, build new models for collection analysis, and evolve what is a library collection that is a collective and that has shared stewardship instead of a single institution's ownership, it's time to build also a new structure, a new framework, an understanding of how we describe what is a library collection. But 
building our new models of collection analysis and collections management so that we can then build that new structure of what our library collections, it requires a significant mental and pragmatic shift. How do we do that? Sociologist Mark Benavetter describes the threshold model of collective behavior where humans have beliefs that is a position one holds in their hearts and in their minds. And humans also have a threshold before they will engage in behavior, usually one that they perceive is, as irrational. He noted that beliefs and thresholds overlap sometimes, but sometimes they don't. One's threshold of engagement or action is strongly influenced by peers, and one's thresholds can vary greatly depending on how that person thinks their peers will perceive their actions. What will my peers think of me when I've done that? Now, considering the necessity that we significantly change our collections development and management, it is then also necessary that we all lower our threshold for engaging in what may feel horrible and like really irrational behavior. As a group of peers, we can come together and conscientiously say, yes, we will do this. We will come together and use quantitative and qualitative data with critical eyes to create a clearer picture of what our communities of scholars need. And we understand that their needs are sold as a community of peers to invoke this necessary change. In 2013, Dan Hazen and Deborah Jacobs wrote, Cultural expression, scholarly communication, and data are moving toward digital modalities of creation and use. The scale of meaningful activity and support of these shifts has clearly surpassed what libraries and their institutions can accomplish on their own. New perspectives and approaches are essential as the entire scholarly community addresses this emergent context. We have both the opportunity and the responsibility to develop a coherent strategy to advance international scholarship. Embracing this opportunity and responsibility that is before us is necessary for our libraries to survive, evolve, and thrive. We've all heard Herbert Spencer's phrase, survival of the fittest, that he used to describe Darwin's natural selection. However, ethologist Mark Beckoff notes that though, to quote, survival of the fittest has always been used to refer the works together, then each individual's chance for survival, and I'd, I'd add thriving, improves, end quote. He notes that animals certainly still compete, but cooperation is central in ev evolution of social behavior, and this alone <laughs> makes it key for survival. Thinking on my experience with the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group these past four months, and in this very new position, I am incredibly inspired and excited about the cooperation I already see and the extraordinary potential for moving to where collective collections as a key component of libraries supporting the entirety of the scholarly ecosystem research cycle is the norm rather than the novelty. When I think of the Ivy Plus libraries as a community, I think of a flock of tundra swans or snow geese. Each bird remains a distinct individual. <laughs> Yet they come together and migrate as is necessary for their survival and in order to th thrive. They migrate as a group so as to cover significantly more us libraries and thank you. Sarah for inviting me to offer a few brief remarks in response. I particularly appreciate the care that Galadriel has taken in elevating her remarks above the immediate operational challenges of implementing above the institution strategies in the 13 Ivy Plus member libraries to focus instead on some of the organizational and indeed institutional constraints on scaling collaboration. There are two particular strengths of the approach that Galadriel has outlined that deserve, I think, special attention today. 
First, the disciplined approach that has been taken in developing the actual business plan for collective collections work within the Ivy Plus libraries. You mentioned that the collection development group was charged with drafting a business case for the various initiatives they are interested in pursuing. This seriousness of purpose But often these peter out after the grant funds have been expended because the institutional willingness to pay for sustained collaborative action around collections is often quite low and it is continually renegotiated. The Ivy Plus group has really distinguished itself by declaring in essence that this work will be self-funded. So I congratulate you and your colleagues on the Collection Development Group for your resolve in thinking clearly about the costs as well as the benefits of cooperative action. And I commend the university librarians of the Ivy Plus Group for raising expectations in this way. The second aspect I think is particularly deserving of note is the commitment to fund the new position that you now occupy. Dorothea Salo, uh, among others, has been very vocal in objecting to the general practice in academic libraries of simply important new library programs in digital humanities, in scholarly communications, in research support services. The same is true of managing collective collections. We simply can't expect coordination of large-scale programs to be a special assignment tacked on to other operations and responsibilities. When the Ivy Plus University librarians agreed to create and fund a new full-time position to support this work, it sent a strong signal to the rest of the library community about the importance that is placed on new cooperative approaches and the very real expectation that they will result in meaningful organizational change rather than peripheral demonstration projects. So bravo to the Ivy Plus group on that score and to you in particular for taking that charge forward. I was also pleased to find echoes in your presentation of Dan Hazen's long-standing interest in mobilizing research collections and getting them into the flow of current digital scholarship and getting the flows of scholarly practice folded back into our evolving collection strategy. I remember 10 or 12 studies collections distributed across North American research libraries weren't managed in the round as an aggregate resource. He pointed at all of the data amassed in union catalogs and wondered why it wasn't being used more imaginatively to track both the direction of current scholarship and the geographic dispersion of historical and legacy area studies collection. Dan had this wonderful, wise, warm smile. Many of you will remember it. And I'm sure he would be beaming at the prospect of the Ivy Plus libraries developing a shared data-informed collection strategy. Several years ago, David Lewis put forward a strategic agenda for academic libraries in the 21st century. In it, he envisioned a reallocation of library investment and attention that would enable a significant redirection of resource away from costly licensing arrangements to support new services that contribute in a more meaningful way to institutional differentiation. One of the most commendable parts of that strategy, I think, of being a non-ARL library. He could depend on Indiana University in Bloomington and other members of the now Big Ten Academic Alliance to acquire long-tail research resources and to look after legacy print collections. This is one of the reasons that a robust shared print strategy and broader network logic for Ivy Plus and other research libraries is so important. The institutions represented in this room don't have the option of outsourcing stewardship of these print resources and other elements of the scholarly record to some other group. 
I'm reasonably optimistic that academic libraries are going to sort the shared print collection. There are, as we all know, now several large-scale initiatives undergirded by sensible business plans in play. And equally importantly, I think there's increasing professionalization of collective collections and particularly shared print management roles, your own position, uh, notably, but we think also uh, There is very clearly an understanding that we need to develop a new professional core of, of individuals who can develop new institutionalized uh, practices for understanding the value uh, and operational requirements of managing collective collections at scale, uh, the necessary bibliographic infrastructure to support shared print management at scale is also beginning to emerge. I'm actually more concerned about the prospects of collect uh, for collective action on the inside out library that Lorcan described in his opening keynote yesterday. Achieving significant economies of scale in managing special collections or in supporting new forms of scholarly production and dissemination is quite difficult. The incentives to manage these resources and operations at group scale are limited, precisely because they are regarded as institutional differentiators. Making a really strong case to the provost or vice president for research that joint action or infrastructure will substantially reduce costs while simultaneously increasing institutional brand value is no easy matter. So as your program takes shape, it will be interesting to see what kinds of collective collection services and infrastructure are ultimately They chart their own course in developing repository infrastructure for teaching and learning objects. What level of institutional investment is appropriate to sustain these efforts? I'm sure there are lots of questions uh, from the audience. I want to seed the conversation for the rest of this uh, session before lunch with just one of my own. You uh, presented, Galadriel, some very interesting data approximating the aggregate collection spend of the Ivy Plus libraries. If I understood the uh, charts correctly, the total spend has leveled out in recent years at about a quarter of a billion dollars. Seventy percent or more of that is allocated to serials, mostly for the widely duplicated licensed e-journal. Uh, electronic uh, packages. A much smaller uh, fraction is invested in print and electronic monographs. We heard about this particularly from uh, Yale moments ago. And there is this relatively small residual investment in bibliographic utilities. I'm curious to know what you think the target distribution should look like for Ivy Plus members. In other words, how much of the current collection spend in Ivy Plus libraries can or should be directed to facilitated collections access as opposed to local purchasing? In your, in your mind. Uh, but more specifically, it would be interesting to hear um, you uh, talk a little bit about how you would expect the impacts of collections collaboration uh, amongst the Ivy Plus group to be reflected in some of the common benchmarks. So for example, the ARL statistics or the IPEDS academic uh, libraries survey. So in other words, where do you expect the, the return on investment for the Ivy Plus collective collections work to be reflected in such a way that other libraries see this as a pattern of behavior uh, that is not risky, but is indeed a path toward the future part of that uh, community migration that you spoke of? So for your first question about distribution, I think that's one of the things we want to start to get at as we look, uh, look at our collective collections analysis project plan and we look at the data available. We really are at the trailhead of trying to figure out what that path looks like. Um, and then when it comes to reflecting the importance of the collaboration and what it means, I think it's really interesting to, that you mentioned ARL stats and iPads because I think we use them. I think our, our institutional administrators use them. But when it comes to our scholars, they're not looking at ARL stats and iPads. They're wanting to know if they can get what they need for their work. Brown, that Borrow Direct is known by name recognition by the parents of the students, and that becomes a reason why 
Brown is a really um, wonderful institution to consider for their child's um, college education. I also know from the earlier this week, the, collect, um, the collections group and the borrowed right to operations and policy groups got together and we heard from users who talked about borrow direct as a verb. They talked about their research and they said, I know I can just borrow direct that. So our scholars and our users understand borrow direct as a service that's for and that's what they're looking for is getting access to the information. I think it's very critical that we as um, library staff that can see both what our administrators want and what our scholars want, bridge, make a bridge, and make that part of the narrative that we share with our institutions. The pre-R materials don't necessarily need to say how many volumes we have. How many, I mean, I'm not even sure we need to say how many volumes we have access to. We need to figure out a metrics of showing the impact and the success. And I'm not sure what that is yet, but I have no doubt we can figure out something. Thank you. Um, I think, I'm sure there are questions uh, from the floor, so perhaps we should open it uh, to the floor. I certainly have more questions that I'd be glad to audience an opportunity to enrich the discussion. Hello, Kevin Merriman from okay. Yale University. I wonder if we are not at a point or coming close to a point where we've maximized the efficiencies of the print sharing option. Um, discoverability of unique holdings notwithstanding, I think that we're in a pretty good place there. But as was mentioned in the rebuttal, a lot of our money, tens of millions of dollars, are going to duplicative licenses for electronic material. And I'm wondering, as we're looking forward, is licensing not another um, opportunity for us to gain leverage? I think that's a very good question, but I, I know too that within the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group, collaborative licensing is something that has come up as a question, but all of the 13 Ivy Plus Libraries are all involved in a variety of cooperative engagements. And one of the things that the Ivy Plus Libraries Collections Group is looking at is where do our efforts and our initiatives those existing arrangements so as not to provide more chaos and clutter and competition. Where does a cooperative investment complement what is happening at Neural, at TRLN, et cetera? So those are all questions that are also being explored. Yeah, Bernie Riley from CRL. Um, Constance, you asked, you said you, you wondered what institutions will be willing to put towards uh, this kind of an effort in terms of resources, what the percentage of total spend might be dedicated to that. They, I can offer one data point, which is the um, CRL, which is, it is a shared collectively, collective collection cooperatively built over about 70 years almost, and about five million volumes and low use material. It's, the data point is that uh, what we found to be tolerable in terms of libraries putting in is about um, one half of 1% of their annual spend on library materials. That seems to be kind of the upper limit of what libraries would put in. But what they put in, in addition to that, and I think has actually been more significant in CRLs, uh, They contribute an enormous amount of time and expertise. Um, it's a, it's a kind of the, the area studies projects in particular that Dan Hazen was so um, deeply involved with are models of information and expertise sharing and models in the trading and exploitation of non-monetary resources. So they, that might be a good useful data point for you. Thank you. It is, and I also wonder if, if that's where the upper limit is now, and if we're looking at rewriting our narrative, editing our narrative, does that upper limit increase? So thinking about the uh, 13 members of uh, Borrow Direct reminds me of two books I just finished reading. One was Hamilton and the other is the first Congress. 
And uh, so much time was spent in the first Congress um, working out things associated with representation and one member, one vote versus the monetary units working across the full, uh, the importance of credit as a concept for strengthening the idea of the nation, what rights and responsibilities would accrue to the collective, what compromises would need to be made for the sake of unity, and uh, whether the Federalists will prevail over the Anti-Federalists. <laughs> All of these issues, I think, are very much uh, pertinent to the early days of this. I agree, and I think, too, one of the things that's very inspiring about IV Plus libraries is if you think of a collective collection, oftentimes that's exemplified or seen right now as a collective collections of figuring out who's going to buy what tangible object. Yet each institution, for very specific institutional reason, reasons, has different circulation policies. So entering into a shared collective collections with equitable access may not work for those institutions where our materials can't circulate right now. That's not to say that that circulation practice as each institution shouldn't be looked at and examined and maybe broadened as it can be. But I also think it's incredibly important to have collective collections beyond just a single initiative. Maybe one institution can't circulate because um, those collections were purchased with an endowed fund that said they can't be circulated. On the other hand, what other assets and incredibly important materials does that library have that they can digitize and share with everyone? So it's not a one-to-one -one of who buys what and who shares what, but it's all of those different um, collaborations that come together to one big collective collection.